word of God today um, for the sermon is from the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, and this is the ESV. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. And in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he is, has inherited is more excellent than theirs. This is the word of Christ. Word of the Lord. Praise be to Christ. Amen. Good morning. As I said earlier, my name is Will Downey. I'm the director of student ministries at the barn, and I'm occasional uh, preaching pinch hitter. So for the next few months, Matt is going to be starting a preaching series on the book of Romans. Today is a little bit of an intro to that, as well as a connection to a couple of the series that he preached last year. Uh, Revelation and Hebrews. I preached a sermon on Revelation, which portrayed Jesus as the triumphant king. And then Hebrews, which portrayed Jesus as the high priest. In Romans, we're going to see Jesus portrayed as the ultimate prophet, revealing God. Maybe you've heard a sermon series on the book of Romans before, but I stick around because I'm pretty sure this one's going to be better than any of the ones you've ever heard. Because it's new. And new things are always better, right? We see that most obviously in technology. Uh, landline telephones used to be ubiquitous in the American home. But now they are starting to be replaced by cell phones as clear upgrades. And even cell phones themselves have gone from being just portable telephones to the computer, media device, communication, organization, jack of all trades that they are in cell phones today. Or consider storage. As a 90s kid, uh, I remember using floppy disks to save things from a computer. And uh, I would have a a very highly pixelated image. And I remember putting in a floppy disk, starting to save it, and then getting a prompt that I needed to insert a second floppy disk to finish the save. Well, floppy disks gave way to the compact disk, or CD. And those have given way to flash drives, which can store hundreds, thousands, um, more data in better formats, and a smaller, more durable package. Then we have transportation. In 1903, the Wright brothers took travel to New Heights. When they took the first sustained flight in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. And that was amazing progress. But their design is now obsolete. Who would fly in a 1903 flyer when you could take off in a Cessna 172? Yes, newer is always better. Except when it's not. Uh, Cars and appliances made today, they have a lot more convenience features built in, but I think the argument could be made that they break down a lot more. And when they do break down, they require more professional, specialized uh, repair so that you can't do it yourself. I am a pretty staunch Apple supporter, um, but if I'm going to be honest, I need to admit that Apple Incorporated doesn't have the same stellar track record today as it did under Steve Jobs. Or look at Star Wars movies. From the 70s to today, there has been a consistent trajectory in the quality of Star Wars movies. For all of our modern toting of progress, perhaps in some cases, newer is not always better. Well, the question of is newer better takes an interesting turn when we aim it at our faith. Our faith in a man whose words were spoken about 2,000 years ago, at the snapshot of time when we see Jesus come onto the scene in the New Testament, he was the new kid on the block. Was he better than anything that came before him? And if so, could he possibly still outshine everything that has come since? I'm sure I'm not the only one who has heard the claim that the Bible is obsolete today. Biblical ethics and morality are out of date. 
and that worshiping a divine creator, sometimes I've heard him called a sky fairy, is an archaic and a foolish practice that modern people wouldn't possibly be involved in. Well, from my complete and unbiased standpoint, as somebody who doesn't have a horse in the race, just a passive observer, I would say yes. Yes, Jesus is better. Better than everything that came before, better than everything has come since, and following him is the best way to be all that we as human beings were made to be. This morning we'll be using Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 to 4 as our launching pad to back up that answer. Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 to 4 will help us see the offices that Jesus held, which will show us the reason that he came, which will then help us understand the role that we have to play, a role that is better than anything that came before and anything that will come after. The offices of Christ reveal the reason that he came and the role that we have to play. Before jumping into the offices of Christ, though, I do think some terminology assistance would be helpful. Christ is not Jesus' last name. People didn't refer to his parents as Mr. and Mrs. Christ. Lazarus didn't look forward to getting his Hanukkah card from the Christ family. Christ is the Anglicized version of the Greek word Christos, which itself is a translation of the Hebrew word Messiah. Messiah. We're more familiar with that one. It's taken on its own meaning in English today, but in Hebrew, Messiah simply meant one who is anointed. What does anointed mean? That leads us into the offices. Offices, the way we're using it this morning, does not refer to the the various remote locations that Jesus had set up all over Judea and Galilee to help him do his work. Offices referred to uh, the special roles that the Messiah, or the anointed one, could hold. In Israel, there were three special roles or offices that featured a special anointing ceremony where oil was poured on the head of somebody who was entering into the position. And those offices are prophet and priest and king. And the duties of these three offices required a special empowerment from God. And so it was symbolized by the anointing oil. Prophets. Prophets were the individuals in the Old Testament who revealed God and his will to the people. Their tagline was, Thus saith the Lord, if you're reading the King James. And it was crucial in that day. Today, if we want to know what God has to say, we have the benefit of his completed word, the Bible. But back in the B.C., God's revelation was still unfolding. It was still being revealed. Scripture was not fully written. And so the words of the prophet were necessary to reveal God and to help the people follow him. The whole uh, tell the future bit that is so often associated with prophets, especially in pop culture today, um, was actually a a very small, though important part of what the prophets actually did. Um, It helped verify that the words of the prophets actually were from God. Now, There were many prophets throughout Israel's history, but the Bible regards Moses as the greatest prophet in the Old Testament. It says as much in Deuteronomy 34.10. Tradition says Moses wrote Deuteronomy. I'm going to let that go for now. He gave the people the Ten Commandments and the law, though, which is pretty important prophetic stuff, revealing God to the people. But even Moses prophesied that a prophet greater than him would come to reveal God more fully. It's Deuteronomy 18.15. Then we have priests. Of the three offices, priests are probably the easiest one for us to understand today because we have a similar role in people like Matt and our elders. In Old Testament Judaism, priests were the temple caretakers and they were the worship leaders in Israel. While prophets came to God on behalf of the people, the priests... Uh, I might have gotten that backwards. Uh, prophets came to the people, people on behalf of God. The priests came to God on behalf of the people. Let's say that again because I messed it up. Um, prophets came to the people revealing God, right? Um, the priests came to God on behalf of the people. Unlike today's priests, Israel's priests need to lead weekly and yearly sacrifices to cover, to atone for sin. And that's because they had no way to remove sin or to change the hearts of the people. Israel would need a better 
priesthood to start making any lasting change. Finally, and latest to the game, we have the kings of Israel, the kings. And the kings were meant to be unlike the kings of the nations around them. The kings were Israel's rulers. But they were not meant to be tyrannical monarchs that were subjugating others under the might of their power and their ego. They were meant to lead the people in righteousness, to lead them in word and example, to faithfully follow God as servant leaders. What we actually got was a mixed bag, though. Uh, Generously speaking, only about a quarter of Israel's kings actually served God and led the people well. Yet God promised King David that his lineage would not be cut off and that a descendant of his would one day come to rule forever in righteousness. 2 Samuel 7.13 Throughout the Old Testament, many figures hold these various offices, and some of them even doubled up, like David, who was king over Israel, but also occasionally stepped into the role of the prophet. Many of the scriptures we have were penned by David. But nobody ever went for the trifecta, and even the best prophets, priests, and kings were only able to fulfill a very small portion of what the office required. We needed something better, and we got it in Jesus. Jesus fulfilled all three offices, the way, um, and the way that he fulfilled them reveals the reason that he came. Jesus came to show us the Father. In 2017, a study was published on social media platforms and their impact on mental health. And the study looked at various factors and whether they increase or decrease things like anxiety, depression, loneliness, positive body uh, image, community, awareness, and, and things like that. And out of all of the platforms studied, only one of them had a positive rating overall. Anybody want to wager a guess at what that might be? Oh, uh, not not in the categories. What social media platform has a positive rating? YouVersion Bible. I love that. I don't think YouVersion Bible was included uh, in the study, but I'm sure it would have done well. Uh, It was YouTube. YouTube. I love YouTube. Uh, it has something for everybody, it has a, and it's the place to go if you need a tutorial on something. Um, just this past week, uh, I tried to open up my car and the door handle came off. So I bought a new part, went to YouTube, looked up replace door handle, 2009 Hyundai Sonata, and boom, found a video. Now, if I could have found it, I might have been able to read a lengthy manual describing the process, and maybe I could have followed it and replaced my door handle. But how much better, quicker, easier, more efficient is it to watch a video by a professional mechanic walking me through step by step and showing me how to do it, showing me what needed to be done? Well, for over a thousand years, prophets came to describe God to his people. They came to tell us about God, who he is, what he values, what he does, and what he wants us to do. And this played a valuable role in the unfolding plan of God's revelation. But when Jesus took on the office of prophet, it was a game changer. Hebrews 1, 1 1-2 states, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. Jesus did not come to tell us about the Father But like YouTube tutorials, Jesus came to show us the Father. Jesus came to show us the Father. In John 14, 9, Jesus tells his followers, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. In the Gospels, we have not just Jesus' teaching, but we have countless examples of how God made flesh responded in radical love to everyday people in everyday circumstances. God can seem so distant, so abstract to us, but we can understand a man. We can understand a man granting dignity to societies disenfranchised. We can understand a man weeping with those who have lost their brother. And while it would be very hard for us to emulate 
we can understand a man crying out in forgiveness to his enemies as they harm him. Though the fad has passed away a bit now, WWJD bracelets, or what would Jesus do, they took off because they reminded people to apply the manner in which Jesus conducted himself to everyday life. And that's a reminder that we would do well to keep at the forefront of our thoughts today, even if uh, the, uh, the swanky bracelets have gone out of style. So Jesus came to reveal the Father. He also came to make final atonement for sin. Michael Jordan won basketball. I'm not saying that he won a game or a championship, though certainly he did. I'm saying in general, he, he just, he won basketball. All right. If you look at different lists uh, of top players of all time, Michael Jordan tops all of them. All right. Some of you who enjoy basketball or uh, followed Michael Jordan might know that there was a, a very brief stint uh, where he put basketball on the side and he became a professional baseball player. Um, he made it to the minor league and did it somewhat successfully before returning to basketball because he's Michael Jordan. Um, some people look at this, that part of his career as kind of like a low point, but I'm thoroughly impressed by that. I mean, you can't be the best in the world at more than one thing, right? Well, apparently you can, because uh, Jesus did. The latter part of Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3 refers to Jesus in his priestly role making purification for sins. That's not a particularly revolutionary thing for a priest to do. It was all part of the regular duties uh, that priests did as people who uh, went before God on behalf of the people. But Jesus, the high priest, did not come to make yearly sacrifices for sin like his predecessors. He came to make one sacrifice himself as the final atonement for sin for all time. Jesus came to make one sacrifice himself as the final atonement for sin for all time. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 to 4, lays out the dilemma. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of those realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered year after year, make perfect those who draw near. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. The Old Testament animal sacrifices were a re reminder of sin, and they pointed to something greater to come. But they were in of themselves insufficient to take away or to atone for sin. But Jesus did what other priests before him could not. Verses 10 uh, and 12 uh, of chapter 10 of Hebrews. But when Jesus had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sin, he sat down at the right hand of God. Verse 14. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. A better high priest offered a better sacrifice. And the effects of this have rippled throughout space and time. All those prior to Jesus and all of those since him have their sins atoned for by trusting through faith in his sacrifices. And now we have access to God without any more need for animal sacrifice, which is great because the Lord's Supper is a lot easier to clean up after uh, than sacrificing a bull up front. This brings us to our final office of Christ, that of a king. The second commandment that God gave to humanity after that uh, be fruitful and multiply bit was to rule the world. Genesis 1, chapter 28. Now, world history, modern politics have rightfully jaded us against those who set out to rule. Politicians all seem like they lie and cheat and steal and look out for their own self-interests. When we get to our election cycle, it's just a matter of trying to pick whichever candidate does that less than the others. And that is in a system of government with abundant checks and balances. People like uh, Vladimir Putin or Kim Jong-un, who rule with no limits, are terrifying. But what does ruling the world look like back in Genesis 1, before sin and self-interest reigned? Well, it looks like Adam and Eve as gardeners, 
cultivating the beauty and the goodness in creation. It looked like servant leaders. The ruling that God intended is almost indistinguishable from examples that we have today and examples throughout the Bible. Even Israel's most revered kings, people like David, Solomon, Hezekiah, they all have chapters that rightfully distress us. And those are the good kings that are ruling over God's people. This doesn't even take into account figures like Pharaoh over Egypt or Nebuchadnezzar over Babylon. Before Jesus, people would never have associated a king with a servant. In fact, one of the biggest obstacles to people accepting Jesus when he arrives on the scene is his surprising lack of bloodlust. People wanted a warrior king that was going to overthrow Rome, not this blessed are the meek, blessed are the persecuted nonsense. What's that about? But Jesus is a different kind of king. He's a better kind of king. He knows how God intended rulers to reign, and he lived it. Jesus came to rule the world in righteousness. Jesus came to rule the world in righteousness. He didn't drop out of heaven, stick in the superhero landing, slaying lightning bolts, subjugating the Jews' enemies. He came born in a stable, riding on a donkey, and preaching peace and love to enemies. And he did come to subjugate humanity's real enemies, Satan, and sin, and death. As Hebrews 1, 8 to 9 says of the Son, your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and it's the scepter of uprightness. That's the scepter of your kingdom. You've loved righteousness, and you've hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. The offices of Christ reveal the reason that Jesus came. As the greatest prophet, he came to show us the Father. As the greatest priest, he came to make final atonement for sin. And as the greatest king, he came to rule the world, but to rule it in righteousness as a servant leader. He clearly and completely outshined all that came before him. But does he still hold up today? What does it look like to follow Christ, and is that still better than all the other ways of doing life that we have out there? Well, I can answer one of those questions for you, because the way that Jesus fulfilled his three offices provides insight into how his followers are to act, and the role that we have to play in the world today. How do we step into the office of prophet today? Well, we share God's truth. We have the privilege as 21st century Christ followers to have open and, ac- open and easy access to God's Word through your version and other formats. And it's expected that we'll use that to share God's truth with a world in need. Matthew 28, 19 to 20, it's a great commission. And in there, Jesus commands his followers to make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all the things that Jesus has commanded. 2 Timothy 4.2 says, preach the word. And in Ephesians 4.15, we're exhorted to speak God's truth in love. The, uh, the in love part is an important qualifier. Sometimes we miss that, uh, but it's there. So that sounds great, but what does it actually look like? Well, towards those who fare, uh, share faith in Jesus, it could look like doing a Bible study. After all, we can't share God's truth if we don't know it. Uh, We don't know what it says and don't know what it means. So getting together to delve deeper into God's word and benefit from the insights of fellow believers is invaluable. The barn has several midweek Bible studies that you could try out. But we don't study for study's sake. We study so that as we grow in depth, we can share God's truth um, more fully. Right? And that could look like encouragement, uplifting a fellow believer with the many promises of God. That could look like um, correction. The way of Jesus is not do whatever you want and who am I to judge sort of way. Uh, actually, to the contrary, uh, Jesus instructed us that if, if one of us sins, um, others should go to that person uh, privately and talk to them. And if they change their ways, then, then that's fantastic, and you've won back a brother. 
Matthew 18, 15. Um, there have been times where some of you have done that for me, and, and I'm so grateful for it. Uh, fairly recently, I was playing a little fast and loose with my words in a group text thread. Uh, and one of my barn friends sent me a private message on the side, suggesting that maybe I'd gone too far. And he was right. I'm really thankful for that. Sharing God's truth could also look like sharing a testimony of how God has worked in your life. That's right. You don't need to attach a Bible verse to it for it to be God's truth. Because all truth is God's truth. Maybe it's a time that the Spirit's convicted you. Maybe it's a situation where God provided for you in a powerful way. Maybe it's a time that you went through a trial and you felt his presence near you. All of these kinds of testimonies remind us and remind other people that, that God's at work, uh, both in us personally and in the community. But sharing God's truth need not and should not be limited to just within Christian circles. Being in relationship with people will mean that sometimes we have an opportunity to share the reason for the hope that's within us in a way that is gentle and respectful. 1 Peter 3.15. Again, the, uh, the gentle and respectful part is another important qualifier in there. Sometimes we Christians miss. Um, Peter was pro-sharing the hope that's inside of you. He was not pro-forcing religion down other people's throats. Um, while our words are important, more often than not, the most appropriate way to share God's truth with non-Christians is by boldly and consistently living in the way that Jesus showed us. So that's the office of prophet. How do we step into the office of priest today? It would seem that with Jesus' once-for-all approach to priesting, the rest of us would be out of the job, right? Well, there are two main ways that I think that we can follow in a priestly role today. Uh, first, we can get involved in serving with the worship service. Whether that be greeting at the front door, preparing communion elements, whether that be leading the singing or actually preaching, uh, running tech, helping spearhead the decorations, serving through the children's church. There are so many ways that we can play a priestly role by facilitating worship for God each week. You don't need a seminary degree to function as a priest. Another way to step into a priestly role today is through committing yourself to intercessory prayer or praying for other people. Matt, myself, the elders, our prayers don't have a more direct line to God than yours. Uh, we are not superheroes, though I will say I do get into my pants, both legs at the same time, each morning, but that's more of a convenience thing than anything. When someone shares something with you, something that's heavy, that's on their heart, and you bring it to God in prayer for them, that is the role of priest. All believers are part of a royal priesthood in Christ, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. And thus, we're able to come to God on behalf of the needs of others. And finally, we come to the office of the king. And the way that we take on the office of the king today is by setting out to rule the world, but not in the way that others have tried, and not in the way that the church has tried at times. I've never heard anybody tell me that the crusades and the indulgences and the political manipulations that characterized the Western church throughout the Middle Ages was, was a high point in living like Jesus. No, we would do well to orient ourselves to the instruction of Christ. We rule by being poor in spirit. We rule by mourning well. We rule by displaying meekness, by hungering and thirsting for righteousness instead of money and power and convenience. We rule by showing mercy rather than dropping the hammer on people anytime we need to get an advantage. We rule by making peace in our homes and our workplaces and in our church rather than obstinately digging in our heels and stirring up needless controversy. And another way that we rule well is when we create, when we cultivate the goodness and the beauty all around us like gardeners. 
this could look, look, look like actual gardening. This could look like doing a community cleanup. Autumn is here, and raking leaves, whether that be for yourselves or for another person, is not a waste of time in God's economy, as it helps others, and it helps uh, accentuate the beauty of the property. This could look like uh, painting, or writing, or wood- woodworking. When it comes to ruling the world, what we do is almost limitless. But it's the how, and it's the why, that we really need to keep centered on. We rule as servant-hearted leaders in the footsteps of the king. The offices of Christ were perfectly fulfilled in Jesus, and they reveal the purpose that he came, a purpose that we now have the honor of partnering with him in fulfilling. And we fulfill our purpose by sharing God's truth, by interceding for others, and by ruling as servants. And now we've come full circle back to our question. Is that, is following Jesus a better way than all the other paths before us? Well, as Philip said to Nathaniel, come and see. Join with me in prayer. God, I praise you for your greatness. I praise you that you are better than all has come before and all that has come since. And God, I I pray that you be with us as we're trying to follow in your steps, as we're trying to be prophets sharing your truth, priests interceding for others, and kings ruling in a way that's humble and servant-hearted rather than overbearing and prideful. Lord, I pray that you give us a vision for what that looks like in our lives, in our work, in our church. And we'll give you all the honor and glory. In your precious name we pray. Amen.